of the union, by which I mean the institution of marriage. And while there's no shortage of couples saying I do, an increasing number are saying I don't. The rate of marriage in Australia has been trending down since the 1940s, with a steady decline since the 70s, from roughly nine weddings per thousand residents then to less than four in 2021. And while legalising same-sex marriage in 2017 gave the institution a boost, the rate of gay couples getting hitched is now also on the decline. The reasons are complex, but according to our next guest, it's in part because marriage is an anti-feminist lie. Clementine Ford Ford's new book, I Don't, makes a provocative case to end an institution she says makes no sense for modern women. And the writer and broadcaster joins us now from Melbourne. Hi there, Clementine. Thank you for your time. Thanks so much for having me. It's uh, always good to talk to people about destroying marriage. Yeah, <laughs> well, we've got a good chunk of time to talk about that right now. <laughs> Your book, it presents this really strong case against marriage, saying that women are, in, are being sold lies to keep them in service for men. Why have you taken this position on marriage and what are your main arguments against the institution? I wouldn't say that I'd, I've taken this position on marriage out of the blue. I feel like it's the natural culmination of, you know, a life, an adult life spent looking at feminist issues, reading more about history, the history that we've been kept from learning about. And I suppose as I went through, you know, a, re a de facto relationship myself, having a child, like many people, that relationship ended. I have been in communication with so many women through my work and also through, you know, the, the magic of social media being able to connect women in these situations and being able to essentially like peel back the curtain and look behind the great charade of it and see what's really lying at its centre. When you look at the history of marriage, there's no such thing throughout most of Western history about you know, people finding their soulmate and marrying their best friend and staying together for the rest of their lives. Women, as we know, for most of Western history, have had no rights in marriage. They've, they haven't even had the right to have their own identity. And so one of the questions that I ask in the book is, why has... Not only why is it so important today that women still feel like they need to be married, but why is it so important for the system and for the state to make women believe that marriage is essential to our well-being? Because it's really anathema to it. Yeah, and you go into also the corporatisation of it, which we'll get onto in just a second. You mentioned there the history of wedding traditions. In your book, um, you outline how mar marriage inherently embodies earlier ideas of women as property to be passed from father to bridegroom. Room. Do you think that's reflective of, of modern day times? Whether or not it's necessarily directly reflective of modern day times is kind of beside the point. The fact is that modern day behaviours and modern day rituals and traditions, and I'm using the air quotes around that deliberately, is that marriage has always been very good at reinventing itself to seem like a, um, an essential human experience and also a very modern one, that, you know, it's what people want. But the reason that, say, for example, like even if people are just kind of adhering to tradition, the reason that a, a father might walk his daughter down the aisle and give her away is because not that long ago, only a few hundred years and for centuries, we had a, a legal doctrine called coverture, which dictated that men were the authority under which women were owned. So a woman was born to a father and she only had any legitimacy as a human if she had her father's name as well. You know, don't let's not forget about all of the... Uh, one of your guests before mentioned single mothers and the marginalisation of single mothers. Let's not forget all of the children throughout history who've been deemed illegitimate bastards because they didn't have the privilege of paternity. And so a, a woman was passed from her the ownership of her father to the ownership of her husband, and she owned nothing. She didn't even own the right to her own body. In Australia, the last place to criminalise marital rape, as in the last place where men were able to claim their conjugal rights from their wives, was the Northern Territory in 1991, and that is as old as Ed Sheeran. <laughs> yeah, who's, that's a good comparison, because um, he's not super old, is he? Um, just one other thing on, on modern times relevance, I want to ask about one of the points, and then we'll open it up um, to the panellists. There's also a suggestion in the book that women are destined for domestic duties and economic disenfranchisement, that women are traded to extend the patriarchy. Do you think that is... Uh, totally relevant today, given the economic empowerment that women have when you look at it from an historical perspective? 
I think it's absolutely relevant, of course, just because we've progressed somewhat further, just because women now, married women, are legally allowed to own property. That's about 140 years old as well, by the way. Just because we have slightly more economic rights doesn't mean that we're not also disenfranchised economically. Divorce in particular is financially punitive to women. So women end up trapped in marriages because the economic reality is that they have no other options. For at least six years after divorce in Australia, women are more likely to suffer about a 21% drop in their economic well-being, whereas men's drop is very, very small and it bounces back pretty quickly. Men are advantaged by getting married and having children economically, in business, at work. Mm. Women, as we know, are disadvantaged by those things. We know that women perform the bulk of the unpaid care work in Australia to the tune of $434 billion a year. We know that people just casually say things like, well, she didn't go back to work because her salary barely covered the childcare. This idea that somehow women's economic role is to perform all of this unpaid labour is exactly why and bless her, I mean, I don't mean this as a disparagement. It's exactly why Annabelle Crabb wrote a book like The Wife Drought, because she, the argument that people need wives is really saying people need unpaid servants. Mm. That's what a wife is. Mm. I'm really keen to open up the idea of marriage to the panel to find out, you know, all your opinions on it. Ginny, you've been married um, twice. What does marriage mean to you? And do you feel like, I mean, there was one quote I want to put to you in Clem's, uh, Clementine's book that suggests that marriage steals time, energy and freedom. Do you ever feel like that? So I, I am married, so I have one former marriage and one that I really like. Um, <laughs> and, and I, the thing is, I agree with everything that Clementine's saying and there was a whole point at which we were like, why are we doing this? And it was completely irrational and we don't really even know now why we wanted to get married. But I wouldn't say that I do any... I do probably do more of the earning. I probably do slightly less of the home-based work. I feel pretty powerful within that relationship. I'm there because I want to be. But I see lots of people who are, you know, doing a way unfair share of the mm. household burden mm. and who also devalue themselves and their earnings because of their relationship. But for me, I'm kind of quite keen on it. I yeah. really like it. So do you think you can be a feminist and still love marriage, the idea of marriage? I think so. I mean, here, here am I telling Clementine, who, like, is the femi feminist, how to do feminist work. Um, like, <laughs> I'll tell you how to do a pap smear and you can tell me how to do feminism because I'm sure <laughs> that I'm, like, not going to do it nearly as well as you. But um, I feel like I'm kind of a feminist and I feel like I really like being married, but I, I'm not that passionate about it. Like, if it hadn't worked out and we couldn't find a date, we would have still lived together and I don't think it would have made any difference. Yeah. I'm not quite sure why we wanted to do it, but yeah. we did. Well, interesting. I'd love to bring you in here, Liz, because you have... You were with your partner, I think, for 28 years, not married, but then decided to tie the knot. Why did you make that decision? Uh, so, as you said, I, we were together for a very long time um, and uh, we'd had seven children, um, uh, obviously outside of marriage. Um, and uh, after COVID and a really rough year, uh, I'd gone through the process of applying for uh, recognition through the Child Institutional um, uh, Sectional uh, Abuse Redress Scheme. And so I was just, just exhausted to my very bones. And I just said, and as a joke, uh, I would say to him, you know, I love you. And he'd say, I'd love you back. And I'd say, one day you'll marry me. And he said, why don't we get married now? And um, so he did. $500, it was, as the celebrant called it, a backyard quickie, uh, which might actually explain some of the kids, but that's, that's another story. But it was, you know, it was in the literal backyard of a suburb in Canberra, um, and I was dressed up in a frock, it was floral, I had flowers in my hair, I've reworn all of these outfits again. Uh, my kids, the motley crew of weirdos, were dressed up however they wanted to be. One was in mi Minnie Mouse with sparkly glitter shoes and a, and a headband. And, um, and my two eldest daughters were our witnesses. So we didn't tell anyone we were getting married. Uh, and we just kind of went, you know, oh, by the way, we're married. And for our honeymoon, we went to Ikea, which is literally <laughs> what happened. We went to Ikea without the kids. We didn't buy anything. But here's the thing, why did we get married? Um, well, for us, marriage was not an important institution, uh, that idea of getting married. My name is still the name I, got re I received at birth. Um, 
but for me, family's essential. And so, um, and I think that that's quite core to the, the, the conversations um, that we, we have around demography and so on, is that families are great shock causes, but also great shock absorbers. No matter what your family looks like, family is core to helping us negotiate all of those stressful parts of our lives, health scares and so on. It might be a friend, it might be a neighbour, whatever that family is, for me, mm. it's my partner and it's my children. They are, they are crucial to my very well-being. I get the inequality bit and I see it in the data, but at the same time, marriage and relationships and family are also the number one vehicle for change. That's where we're seeing change. People are reno getting, renegotiating what it means to be a family. So we're seeing families um, uh, move much faster than our data collection can. And so what we see families look like is not what policy thinks about family. So if we want to talk about outdated institutions, we should really talk about uh, policies and we should really talk about things like the police force and the justice system that trap women and sexual yeah. mm -hmm. uh, assault victims and, and survivors into all sorts of hurt. Mm -hmm. And I know that we can have dual identities and dual concerns all at once, um, but, but um, for me and for my upbringing and from where I come from, family is, is, is how I solve my, my issues and how I move forward as a person. Mm. John, you two are married. Do you see uh, marriage as an institution as an extension of the patriarchy? Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't think anyone would disagree with the points that Clementine makes in, in her book. And I've had a, a chance to kind of look at some of the arguments she makes. And, you know, I don't think anyone's here to defend the marriage industrial complex. And, um, you know, I, I, what I would add into this conversation is, you know, just yesterday was Halloween and, you know, I was walking the streets of Marrickville and kids and families are out there everywhere and uh, realising that we're connected more than just by our ideology, but by we, we're connected by footpaths and communities and we live in a culture that is devoid of, of some rituals and marriage as defined by the Australian government is a legal contract that binds two people together. And uh, I don't think many of us are uh, looking at that contract for everything that can be said about it from Clementine's uh, book, which I think will go down in history as um, of the beginning of something that led to some significant change. Is uh, what sort of? But change? for me, well, I think we need to look. We all dream of that day where there is uh, where two people can join together. I personally think marriages should be like driver's licences. They should be issued for five years and then annulled at the end of five years and then you have <laughs> oh, to... Uh, oh, and then you have to go You're and freely... You're making a lot of work for divorce lawyers there, back. aren't you? No, no, it, they're just automatically... Annulled, annulled. right. Just, OK, so just... And then you have to <laughs> woo yourself back in. Right. But, see, marriages, for me, from my view, it's covenant, which is a, a set of promises that are made by two people. And why I say that is important, because when we don't have rituals, we've lost most of the rituals of our culture. And I talk about Halloween, people want that ritual in including rites of passage. And where there isn't a male rites of passage, what I do see is people of my age and still what you'd call an adolescent by nearly 50. And what they're looking for in a marriage is a substitute mum. We don't need more of that. We don't. We shouldn't have any more of that because that is points to exactly the issues that are raised and what we're discussing mm. now is servitude and uh, possession and chattel, which leads to mm. Mm. increased family and domestic violence. So, you know, I I, I love love, and uh, I've, I've done that hundreds and hundreds of weddings. I'm You've wayside done fifty thousand at the wayside. Fifty thousand yeah. of them. Yeah. I've done my, a fair share of a few thousand, but about that. That, that promise making that's not just between two people, but between families and communities, that we, we, we make these vows to say, we will journey together. And we, the, per, the, the kid who's said, I promise to be with you forever at 25 is not who I am today, and nor were the promises mm. to the mm. person who I made, the person who is uh, now, you know, is now my wife. We're, it's the same person, we're still married, but we're very different people to you those, those young yeah. people. We've grown together. But at every season in life, and yes, last week, my youngest finished year 12, we're at a very different phase. And so we're saying, who are we? 
Yeah. Hey, let's go on a few dates. Let, yeah. Let's see. If or maybe do like that. Don't wait as well. You know, keep that kind of alive while you're there. Clementine, I noticed you were nodding a fair bit then through um, what John had, had to say. Do you get the sense that we are mature enough as a nation to look at the evolution of the institution and that for change to come? I mean, Australia can't even recognise its own original first people, so I don't think that saying that we're mature enough as a nation on marriage is necessarily the follow-through. Um, I do think... I, I mean, I really resonated with what John and Liz were saying about family. The problem, I think, is that there is a very limited way in which to be a family economically and policy-wise. Like, Liz's points about policy are really key. When we reduce the idea of family within a government policy structure and economically to just this sort of nuclear system, we're really creating a very perfect storm for mothers in particular who end up mothering on the margins. Mm. So if we live in a society that says, well, we value motherhood and we ca take care of children and we protect mothers and mothering is the most important thing <coughs> that a woman can do. And, it's the, and you know, the, the sort of extrapolation of that and the very conservative mindset of if you don't become a mother, then you will be bereft somehow because a woman's biological nature is to nurture, which, by the way, invented by Victorian era scientists, not much older than that. But that's a f that's a lie and we know that that's a lie because if you're a single mother then you're not supported by the government you're not supported by economic policy you're not supported by yeah. social policy if you're a disabled mother if you're a black mother like aboriginal mothers in this country are still persecuted mm. in levels that we could i can't possibly imagine as a white middle class woman that is not valuing motherhood and it's definitely not valuing children so when we create a set of conditions that says that pretends that a society in in terms of its government policy values the family but then in every respect makes it clear that not like that though mm. not like that not like yeah, that and and i think i think what you say is really important clem is that um uh, the, that the privilege uh, that is embedded in the in the system and so on, and I think for for some there is protection in this notion of um, I guess a, a partnership and so on, and I think that um, privilege can sometimes um, alter the way that we we view relationships and family. So where I'm from, you know, fam family is really important. Family is that way that we kind of pull resources and, um, uh, you know, if you know someone needs a car, then we help them out with the car. That's that notion of family. You know, mm -hmm. you, you have a money problem, okay. So that, that notion of, of kinship and family is, is not what, what would be considered mainstream, but I'm seeing more and more that recognition that that sort of notion of family is okay. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that, you know, and I'm gonna say something on national TV that I never thought I would, and I'm gonna bit of, get a bit emotional. I'm not a heterosexual woman. And I'm, I'm in a relationship with a fella and I think the fact that I can say that now, my kids know it and so on, it's not something I hide. But that's something we should be able to celebrate, mm. that we no longer have to hide all of these identities mm. uh, and we can still engage and enjoy those sorts of um, uh, traditional looking types of things and make them our own we change and we make things suit ourselves mm. and, and suit our own cultural needs. Mm. Yeah, so I, I think, thank you so much for sharing that. Very brave and uh, courageous. I think, uh, I don't think it's a question of our, are we mature enough as a nation, but I think, I, I do believe in the power of a culture to readapt and reinvent some mm. of the institutions that we have that can be done in ways that promote fairness and equality and diversity and acceptance. So uh, thank you mm. so much for sharing yeah. that. And